We have uh, Nikki today who is working in Lancaster and uh, she has done the exam some time ago and she's been a mentor for some time. She will be talking about spinal infections and without any further ado, this is uh, Nikki. Uh, thank you. So, um, good evening everyone and the topic I'd like to talk about this evening is spine infections for the FRSCS exam. Um, this is one of the um, FRCS critical conditions um, and I'd like to recommend these papers. So the first three are quite recent um, reviews on the management of spinal infection. Okay. So the first three papers um, are available on free access and they provide a very good summary of the latest thinking with regard to spine infections. Um, I also would like to acknowledge Mr. Philip Sell, who's a consultant spine surgeon in Leicester, um, who did a presentation at the EFORT conference last week, and this is available on the EFORT website. So looking at some definitions, um, infection in the spine can consist of infection of the vertebral body, the vertebral end plates, uh, the disc and the paraspinal tissues, um, as well as epidural abscesses and intraspinal lesions. It represents about 2 to 7% of all musculoskeletal infections, and it's got an incidence between 1 in 100,000 to 1 in 250,000. It's slightly more common in males than females, um, with a ratio of 2 to 1 to 5 to 1, depending on which paper you read. There is a bimodal distribution, so generally the young under the age of 20, and the um, more elderly people between the ages of 50 and 70. The mortality rates are between 2 and 20% worldwide. And the incidence has been increasing in the last decade. Um, some ideas of to why this is happening have improved, have included our improved diagnostics, older patients with chronic disease, um, increased intravenous drug users, and an overall increase in spinal surgery and instrumentation. So this is an FRCS critical um, case, critical condition, um, which means it's pass fail um, when it comes to your exam. The important thing is to have a high index of suspicion. A lot of these patients have a non-specific presentation and the diagnosis is often delayed by approximately one to three months or two to six months in some papers. They may require emergency treatment and the outcome may be catastrophic if the diagnosis is missed. There's no definitive logarithm for diagnosis and treatment in these cases, and there are significant medical legal outcomes. Um, the mortality, as I said before, is between two and four percent. Patient can range from being acute, um, severe back pain with neurological deficit, and a patient in septic shock, to Someone that's just gently mobilizing around, no fevers, um, just got a little bit of back pain that doesn't seem to be getting any better. The problem with spine infections is this delay in diagnosis, which on average is between one and three months and it's two to six in some papers. Some of these patients may need emergency treatment and if it goes unrecognized without treatment, the outcomes can be catastrophic. Unfortunately, there's no definitive logarithm for diagnosis and treatment that we can all follow. So a lot of the studies tend to be cohort studies, um, level three and four, and a lot of um, expert um, testimony, really. Um, it does have important medical legal complications, um, and it's got a mortality of two to four percent. So these are some of the risk factors. So age, we've got this bimodal distribution, the young and the old. Chronic disease, um, so diabetes, renal failure, um, alcoholism and cirrhosis seems to come up very often in these papers. Um, rheumatological diseases and obviously oncological diseases. Um, iatrogenic causes, so spinal or epidural injections, spinal surgery and instrumentation, and there's one paper that suggests that longer surgical time, um, a lumbar posterior approach more than an anterior cervical approach 
is more likely to um, result in an infection, multiple procedures and obese patients. And there is actually a paper that classifies the obesity on the amount of subcutaneous fat that needs to be closed. Um, obviously immunosuppression, whether it's host related or from chemo or radiotherapy or steroids, intravenous drug users. So geographical regions, you would think of rare causes such as brucellosis and TB. And obviously we need to consider that in our local population in the UK, where we may have a high um, immigrant population and obviously trauma. So there's three major agents. Um, the main ones are the bacteria usually cause a pyogenic infection and the main one is Staph aureus um, with E. coli probably secondary to UTI coming in second. In some areas MRSA is also a problem. The granulomatous infections such as TB and fungi and less common would be parasites. So as I said before depending on the population that you're dealing with um, TB may be a very high consideration in your patients and propionobacterium um, this causes a non-pyogenic infection um, it does cause infections in shoulder surgery and also in young girls following scoliosis surgery particularly if they've got a lot of um, acne so this is a classification system um, which is described by Thalgott in 1991, which is quite a while ago. And the aim of it was to gauge uh, post-op spine infections, split into group one, group two, group three, depending on the pathogens, and then subgroups, which are dependent on the type of patient. So routes of infection. Um, the main one would be hematogenous, um, affects the lumbar spine more than the thoracic and more than the cervical. Um, TB would preferentially affect the thoracic spine in general. And this is often related to the vascular supply, which we'll touch on in a moment. Um, direct external inoculation, so typically surgery, spinal anesthetics, lumbar punctures, um, and then contiguous spread which um, in the literature is described as rare. So they've put down infected aortic implants, esophageal rupture, ileosoas abscess. I've put query inflammatory bowel disease because where I'm working currently, we've actually had two patients, one who had ulcerative colitis and another one who had Crohn's disease who were under the general surgeons and subsequently developed back pain. Both of these patients ended up with um, one had an epidural abscess which needed to be drained and the other one had quite severe spondylodiscitis with uh, progressive deformity and progressive neurology. So I think anything within the abdomen that can get towards um, the spine, we need, to be, we need to have it in the back of our minds. So this is the vascular supply. So the arterial supply, um, is shown <clears throat> is shown there and as we know the um, arterial supply reaches the end plate but doesn't cross into the disc in children there's still some vascular channels so in children any infection in the vertebral body can go directly to the to the disc straight into the um, center of the disc which is a vascular in adults and cause a discitis in adults tends not to be as common. And then the other theory about um, infection is the Baston's plexus and whether you can get infection via this plexus from um, an alternative source in the body. So presentation, as I said, it can be nonspecific. Somewhere between 85 and 90% will have some kind of axial pain, whether it be back chest or neck pain. Obviously the problem is with chest pain, it could be cardiac, it could be pulmonary, it could be upper GI. Typically the pain is unremitting and is worse at night and the patients are reluctant to mobilize. 
about 15% will have neurological symptoms, which could be radicular, uh, including chest and abdominal pain, or related to cord compression, um, leg weakness, numbness, incontinence. About half of the patients with a pyogenic spondylodiscitis will have a fever. Um, only about 17% will in TB. Things to consider are dysphasia and torticollis if you've got a cervical disease. And a lot of the time and very early, most patients don't, sorry, 30 to 70% of patients don't show any signs of an infection. So examination. So I'm just moving this out of the way. Um, their temperatures may be normal. We need to look at their markers such as pulse, blood pressure, respiratory rate. Examine the spine. Do they have a kyphotic deformity? Are there any areas of swelling or tenderness within the spine? Are there any neurological deficits? Any signs of cord compression? And then we're looking at things that could be a red flag, um, which would be things like cardiac new heart murmur, peripheral stigmata of um, bacterial endocarditis, such as Janeway lesions. Um, and 30% of people with a pyogenic gram-positive spondylodiscitis have infective endocarditis. So these patients, you need to, sorry, I would consider an echocardiogram in these patients. And then pediatrics can be difficult because um, the signs are nonspecific. Typically, you've got a child that's a bit irritable, refuses to crawl or walk, may have abdominal pain, may have incontinence. Um, fever is rare, and the most common sign is a loss of their lumbar lordosis. So investigations. Essentially, CRP is the mainstay of investigations. It's elevated in about 90% of spondylodiscitis cases, and it's a very good marker um, to assess your response to treatment. The ESR is also a sensitive marker, but it's not as specific. The white cell count is not very specific. Procalcitonin is not very useful. Blood cultures, so you want at least three sets of blood cultures. And the literature says up to 59% of blood cultures will identify the causative organism in a monomicrobial spondylodiscitis. Urine cultures, if you're considering hematogenous spread, and um, interferon gamma release assays can give you a result for TB in 24 hours if they're available. Um, acid fast bacilli smear and culture takes six to eight weeks and has a sensitivity of 59%, which is increased if you use the IGRA. So, what can we do for imaging? Well, our first line is always um, x-rays. So x-rays have got a relatively low specificity, um, at least in the early stages. So in someone that's under three weeks, you may not see anything on the x-rays. Around about three to four weeks, um, if you look at this picture here, you might see some irregularity of the end plates um, and a little bit of sclerosis as well as some uh, narrowing of the disc, plate, disc space. Um, there's, you also might see a little bit of deformity. In here, there'd be flattening of the lumbar lordosis. And then long term, you may see this picture where you've got obliteration of the disc space and at least pseudoankylosis. CT scan. So CT scan can be useful um, if you've got a patient that can't have an MRI scan, um, and what they do is they will show you the bony changes very well. So in this case, um, you've got destruction of the inferior end plate and the superior end plate um, with some sclerosis around here. And the same on this, just the same picture, but at a different cut showing the defect um, in the vertebrae you can't see i can't see any soft tissue swellings on those but sometimes you can so the gold standard is an mri scan with gadolinium it's got a high sensitivity and a high specificity so on the t1 images 
you'll see a low signal. Um, and on the T2 images or the enhanced images, you'll see this, which is a high signal within the vertebral bodies. Um, and on this particular one, you can see this area of high signal here, which represents an epidural abscess. The um, MRI scan is good for looking for any collections, whether they're anterior, um, posterior to the vertebral bodies or in the posterior part of the spinal canal. And they can differentiate between pyogenic spondylodiscitis, TB, and other pathologies such as degenerative changes or tumors. So this is just a table to show the difference between MRI findings in a pyogenic spondylodiscitis versus a TB. So in a pyogenic, most often affects the lumbar region, whereas TB tends to prefer the thoracic and thoracolumbar region. The vertebral body is involved in pyogenic um, and the, sorry, the disc space is involved in pyogenic, whereas in TB, you tend to get disc space sparing early on in the disease and you tend to get anterior spread of the disease beneath the anterior longitudinal ligament, um, which jumps the disc and goes to the next vertebrae and produces scalloping of the anterior border of the vertebrae. Um, if you're looking in the paraspinal and epidural space, then you may find small abscesses um, with a thick and irregular rim enhancement. In TB, you'll have large paraspinal abscesses with a thin and smooth rim enhancement. The posterior elements are typically not involved in pyogenic, but can be involved in TB. Anterior spread is uncommon, but it's quite common in TB um, and can be more extensive than the vertebral involvement. With regard to the vertebral destruction, you get end place destruction in pyogenic spondylodiscitis and you get a lot of bone destruction, destruction in TB. Um, it's uncommon to have multi-level lesions in pyogenic spondylodiscitis, but not if you've got an epidural abscess, whereas uh, in TB you often see skip lesions. So other, other types of imaging, uh, which are mentioned, but not very often used. So you can use a CT SPECT um, with gadolinium or um, a bone scan with sequential and gallium images. They can be used in patients that don't have, that are not able to have an MRI scan, uh, but they're not as um, specific as an MRI scan. Um, a PET scan, if you have it available, um, can be used in the absence of spinal instrumentation and the advantage of it is is that you don't get the um, intense FDG uptake in degenerative changes and fractures only in the signs of infection and flexion extension x-rays may have a role in diagnosing instability so overall as far as imaging goes MRI is the gold standard So how are we going to make this diagnosis? Well, we've got to have a clinical suspicion um, based on our history and our examination findings. We're then going to do our preliminary investigations, including white cell count, CRP and ESR, three sets of blood cultures, urine cultures and an MRI scan. Now, if we have positive MRI and positive clinical findings, then we have an option. If it's stable, then we can go to a biopsy, immobilization, intravenous antibiotics, and continually reevaluate. If it's unstable, either the patient unstable or the um, spine alignment unstable, then we may need to go to surgery for an open biopsy, drainage, um, plus or minus decompression, and usually at least some form of stabilization um, at the initial surgery. Again, intravenous antibiotics. So 
if we go back and we've got a negative scan and we're not sure about our clinical findings, then we need further investigations and we need to reevaluate the situation. So our treatment plan is always antibiotics. And I'll talk about them a little bit more uh, later on. Immobilization with a brace or a halo, the idea behind that being pain relief and to reduce any further deformity. Um, bed rest is in some of the older papers, but I don't think it's practiced very much um, anymore. Biopsy, so the important thing is that you need to obtain a definitive causative organism so that you can direct your antibiotic treatment. If the patient is stable enough that you don't need to start antibiotic treatment straight away, then you should at least try and get a biopsy before you start the antibiotics. Obviously, if the patient is septic, we need to start the antibiotics and then go on to do a biopsy later. And then there are indications for surgery, uh, debridement and decompression of the spinal canal. Maybe you need to get an open biopsy and you may need fixation to preserve or restore the spinal structure and stability. The important thing about these patients is whatever treatment you start, you need to monitor their response and you need to frequently reevaluate them. So somebody who you initially think is stable and can be managed non-operatively, you need to keep a close eye on them because in two weeks, it may be that they've got progressive spinal deformity, developing neurological symptoms and are actually not responding as well to the antibiotics as what you would hope. So I'll put this in here. So this is the epidural abscess. Um, and these are the ones that we need to pick up straight away because they can be life-threatening and they've got a high mortality rate between five to 16%. They can be secondary to a spondylodiscitis or they can be iatrogenic after surgery or an epidural catheterization. Uh, lumbar is more commonly affected than the thoracic and cervical area. They can be multi-segmental and they do need urgent decompression. So the top MRI scan shows an epidural abscess. Um, it's around the posterior elements, and you can see the thick um, enhancement with the gadolinium and the subsequent spinal cord compression. And if we look at the other diagram, this is um, again an epidural abscess, which is formed posteriorly. Again, you can see the rim enhancement, and this has gone over multiple segments. Um, and you can see that the spinal cord has been significantly compressed. So antibiotics, this is a bit controversial. Um, if controversial as in the choice of antibiotics, not as to whether you should use them or not. If your patient's stable, you would want to try and get a biopsy first. And you can do this by CT guided biopsy if your service operates it. Um, or you may need to do an open biopsy. Essentially, we want to cover Staph aureus and E. coli, which are the main pathogens, plus or minus MRSA, depending on your area. There's different recommendations um, as to the types of antibiotics you should use and in what combination. And what I would suggest is that you look at your own trust guidelines. So, these are the these are what so my guidelines in Lancaster are clindamycin and ciprofloxacin. Um, some of the other guidelines in different areas of countries are kefataxim and flucloxacillin. Uh, vancomycin, if it's indicated, if you're in an area of MRSA, and the American Society of Infectious Diseases suggests you keep the levels above the trough levels above 15 grams. Um, what I would say in the exam is you would liaise with your microbiology team to suggest the most appropriate antibiotics. We wouldn't routinely cover TB and brucellosis unless we have positive findings for that. The current recommendations are two to six weeks of IV therapy followed by six weeks of oral therapy. The decision to change from intravenous to oral depends on the response. So your clinical response and your CRP. So Philip Sell says if the CRP drops below 50, you can consider changing from IV to oral. With regard to the duration of antibiotics, we tend to do 12 weeks in total. 
but the literature doesn't necessarily support this. And again, I'd be guided by your local microbiology um, consultants. The only randomized control trial doesn't show any difference between uh, six weeks and 12 weeks of treatment. With regard to TB, um, again, you're looking at treatment for at least a year on the four drugs, um, isoniazid, rifampicin, uh, perizidinamide and ethambutol um, for two months, followed by another 10 months of isoniazid and rifampicin. Again, I'd be guided by your microbiologist. The problem is that there's no clear evidence in the literature to support which, which antibiotic for what duration. So biopsy. This depends on um, how stable your patient is and what your trust offers. So CT guided, um, just some, you only need a local anesthetic. It depends on whether your radiologist is happy to do it or not. Um, and it depends on the stability of your patient. In our situation, we probably need to transfer to a spinal centre because our radiology department wouldn't do this. An open biopsy, if you've got um, an unstable or a deteriorating patient, um, you can do an open biopsy and that gives you the advantage of being able to decompress and debride at the same time, as well as providing some instrumentation. Um, the recommendation is three core biopsies, one for histology and two for microbiology. So non-operative treatment. This depends on you having a stable patient. Um, so antibiotics, which we've talked about. If you have a patient that doesn't need urgent surgery, um, it's reasonable to do at least a trial of antibiotics after you've got your biopsy, but you need to keep reevaluating them. Orthoses, so a collar, a halo, or a TLSO. But again, if you're using orthoses rather than spinal instrumentation, you've got a higher rate of non-union. Uh, bed rest, as I said earlier, not used very often anymore. You need to monitor them for deterioration. And you can consider CT-guided percutaneous drainage if you've got a very, very sick patient who's not fit for surgery. So surgery, um, your indications, definite indications would be neurological deficit um, or a progressive change in the neurological state, sepsis, spinal instability due to the bone destruction, severe kyphosis, um, an intra-canal spinal lesion with a mass effect on the cord, a failure of your conservative treatment, or an epidural abscess. And your surgical goals are to decompress the spinal canal, stabilize the involved segments, aggressive tissue debridement, and biopsy. So this is a picture of um, this gentleman is about 40, sorry, 53 years old. He's an IV drug user and he developed spondylodiscitis in the subaxial cervical spine. This is um, Mr. Sell's patient. He um, presented to Mr. Sell and had urgent anterior decompression and fixation. Um, he then went in a little while later, I think he said about two or three weeks and did posterior stabilization to augment the um, initial anterior stabilization. Um, and the guy did very well. He's still an IV drug user, um, but the, ex the far x-rays are 14 years after his surgery. And he does have a little bit of a kyphotic deformity developing, but functionally he's managing quite well. So a little note on TB. So this is, the difference with TB in that you, you've developed this anterior abscess with scalloping of the vertebrae and it spreads underneath the anterior longitudinal ligament. The disc is being destroyed in this diagram, but it's relatively preserved on the other side. Your anterior longitudinal ligament is raised and it spreads from one vertebrae to the other down the anterior aspect. And it causes a kyphotic deformity. So it's typically in the thoracic spine and 
you get a progressive kyphotic deformity, which eventually causes um, spinal cord compression. So, in summary, um, your indications for surgery are going to be an acute or progressive neurological deficit, an intraspinal lesion, instability, or ineffective conservative therapy. Antibiotic therapy in all cases, immobilization, regular review, high index of suspicion, and the important thing is to get a biopsy, ideally before you start the antibiotics. That's it. Thank you, Nikki. That was well presented and well prepared, and I think it is very thorough. Um, I have some questions. Uh, before we ask these, guys, if any one of you has any questions, please write them down so that we can, or type them so that we can uh, direct them to Nikki or to the mentors. So I have a couple of questions from Atif Mahmoud. Um, the first question is, if the disc is avascular, Yes. Why is discitis more common than vertebral osteomyelitis? So, there's um, what happened. I'm looking for the slide. I think what happens is that you get the destruction of the um, end plates, and once you go through the end plates, um, it can go straight into the disc, which is avascular. So the infection will sit um, within the disc space um it tends to be well i'm just trying to think it tends to be a spread from the um adjacent vertebrae rather than uh the disc itself unless you've had some kind of direct inoculation or you've got local spread that's my understanding of it i'm good so there are two theories these are usually the majority of discitis, they usually start, there is hematogenous spread. The hematogenous spread is either from the arterial or from the venous. Uh, from, if it's from the arterial, it usually starts as vertebral in the metaphysis of the vertebral body. And these are usually start as vertebral osteomyelitis rather than discitis. And then they come and to progress to discitis later on. And usually there are a couple of studies saying that the majority of these they are start as you can see them as the change is uh, in MRI as modic one modic type one. You can see a lot of reports in the radiology report. They say modic type one, and these modic type one these are usually they some people they are now consider it as early early discitis or vertebral osteomyelitis. It's very hard to distinguish which is which. Usually they start as metaphyseal vertebral osteomyelitis, and then they progress later on as discitis. MR, MR the whole spine to look for any skip lesions as well. So, you know, I, I'm just thinking what would be the exam answer? Should, should I just focus on the, let's say, the lumbar spine or the cytopenomus or should I MR the whole spine? Um, I would say MR the whole spine because the problem is, you, unless you, you don't quite know what you're dealing with, that's the problem with spine infection. So, if you do have a discitis or a vertebral osteomyelitis, then you don't know if you've got, an, you know, you could have an epidural abscess, but then it could spread further up. Um, TB can have skip lesions. So based on what I've read through the literature and talking to um, Mr. Sell, I would say I would MRI the whole spine because if you've got hematogenous spread at one level, you can easily have it at another level. Um, I think if you just said lumbar spine because it's the most common, I think they'd trip you up and give you something in the thoracic spine. So I think the safest thing to say in an exam is I would MRI the whole spine. Thank you. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Any other questions, guys? Okay, if we have no questions, then we will wrap the presentation uh, up. Thank you very much, Nikki. Okay. Uh, don't leave, guys, because there will be some viva questions if we have uh, 